Hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. Zip Recruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on Zip Recruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And Zip Recruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive, so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. Zip Recruiter. Is how you find them. Businesses of all size trust Zip Recruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try Zip Recruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. That's ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. <laughs> this, this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, 250-plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio, Sirius XM style, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. Obviously a lot of stuff to get into, no doubt about it, today, and we will most certainly do so, okay? Without hesitation, I got a lot of stuff that I want to get into. And forgive me for pausing a little bit uh, for a second here, being a little bit sloppy, but I'm going to my notes because I want to make sure I got all my requisite stuff right in front of me. By the way, you know when it's something so obvious they call it a no-brainer? Well, here's a big one. Barbasol is finally making razors. Introducing the Barbasol Ultra 6 Plus. It's got six ultra-thin blades for a close, comfortable shave. You can go to Barbasol.com right now and save... Some money. That's a no-brainer, too, by the way. It's time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Got a lot of stuff to get into today, a lot of stuff that is unavoidable. We all know this. We will get into it because we have to. Okay? We absolutely, positively have to. Because the NFL is making news. We've got a Western Conference Finals to talk about. Because Houston has even that series up 2-2. That subject is going nowhere. I will most certainly talk about that. Because I saw some heroics last night and some individuals that deserve major, major props. We've got an Eastern Conference Finals going on in Boston, Massachusetts tonight. Game five, that series is tied 2-2. LeBron James is going into Boston, Massachusetts to go up against the Celtics. Cleveland loses this game. As far as I'm concerned, they lose the series. We'll be talking about that one. But the NFL takes precedent at this particular moment in time. And here is the reason why. News has come down. And here is the headline. The National Football League owners have approved a national anthem policy for the year 2018. To read from NFL.com, the NFL will enact a national anthem policy for 2018 that requires players and league personnel on the sideline to stand but gives them the option to remain in the locker room if they don't want to stand. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell announced today, under the change approved by team owners at the spring league meeting, individual clubs will have the power to set their own policies to ensure the anthem is being respected during any on-field action. If a player chooses to protest on the sideline, the NFL will find the player. The player also could be fined by his team. NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport and NFL Network's Judy Batista reported. ESPN is reporting the same thing, by the way. Goodell said the six changes under the policy were unanimously approved by team owners. Quote, the policy adopted today was approved in concert with the NFL's ongoing commitment to local communities and our country. One that is extraordinary in its scope, resources, and alignment. With our players, Goodell said in a statement, we are dedicated to continuing our collaboration with players to advance the goals of justice and fairness in all corners of our society. It was unfortunate that on-field protests created a false perception among many that thousands of NFL players were unpatriotic. 
This is not and was never the case. The NFL Players Association says it was not consulted about the new policy before owners voted on it. From the NFL Players Association, here's a quote. The NFL chose to not consult the union in the development of this new policy. NFL players have shown their patriotism through their social activism, their community service, in support of our military and law enforcement, and yes, through their protest to raise awareness about the issues they care about. The vote by the NFL club CEOs today contradicts the statements made to our players' leadership by Commissioner Roger Goodell and the chairman of the NFL's management council, John Mara, about the principles, values, and patriotism of our league. Our union will review the new policy and challenge any aspect of it that is inconsistent with the collective bargaining agreement. You see, here's the problem. Here, here we go again. Before we've had an opportunity to pass gas, before somebody noticed one of us had bad breath, the NFL PA is already fighting with the NFL. Because of, mere, of the mere fact that these rules were not thrown in the direction of a Players Association for approval before they were adopted by the NFL. Here you're having a Players Association who has admitted they have not seen the new policy already challenging something they haven't even seen. So we got that problem right there. Let me tell you what the bigger problem is, ladies and gentlemen. Contrary to what people like my producers and others will say, in terms of This problem being resolved, no, it isn't. Do you think the American people are fools? Do you think folks in America are fools? Do you think we, as spectators, as fans, are fools? No, we're not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is still a problem. And you know why it's a problem? Because the NFL didn't deal with it a long time ago. It cats out of the bag now. Who the hell tells y'all this is going to work? Will Kane filled in for Molly Kerm today on first take. Did an absolutely outstanding job moderating. There's actually some hope for him after all. I thought he was a lost cause. He actually moderated well. I got to give him credit where credit is due. Not better than me, of course, but he has potential. (laughs) I'm only playing with him. Here's the deal. The reality is this. Like I told him, like I told my man Max Kellerman on first take this morning, every weekday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, that's my television show. The cat's out the bag. You've already told the world where you stand. You've got the president of the United States, in my opinion, on this vendetta tip, targeting the NFL in such a way that made things uncomfortable. And now you think by sheer virtue of the fact that you're going to let folks stay inside the locker room and not come out onto the field during the national anthem, that that's going to resolve matters. Well, what about when they come running onto the field after the national anthem has played? You don't think fans, his constituency, and others who support their position of labeling the players anti-patriotic? You really, really think they're not going to notice guys coming out of the locker room? The cat's out of the bag. They'll be what? Unless you're going to put on some other body, somebody else's uniform. Unless you're going to disguise your numbers. What difference does it make? You better come out there with one of those capes on, disguising your uniform number and what have you, and do it that way. Because as long as they see you coming out of that locker room after the national anthem is being played, you're one of those guys. You are Colin Kaepernick. You are Eric Reed. You're anybody who takes that position. That's who you are. Who told you you're going to be able to get away with that? Now, for the record, let me state this to all of those quote-unquote patriots out there. The people who are anti-American would happen to be you. In this country, 
you have a right to protest. In this country, you have a right to peaceful for peaceful protests. In this country, you have a right to do those things, particularly if you're not inhibiting anybody else's enjoyment. Colin Kaepernick's protest never once got in the way of a football game being played. It didn't stall traffic. It didn't block the gates, the entrances through the turnstiles. It didn't interfere with the game once kickoff time arrived. It did nothing. All of this uproar that was created was simply because of something you don't like. I would remind you that once upon a time, Colin Kaepernick sat down for the national anthem. And then a gentleman who served in our military approached him and explained to him how disrespectful that was. And that he would prefer that you do something else because anything else came across as flagrantly disrespectful to our servicemen and women. And Colin Kaepernick said, I certainly did not want to do that. Which was why he came up with taking a knee. But people forgot that. You forgot the fact that he made a concerted effort to not disrespect our servicemen and women. That's why the knee came about as opposed to him sitting down like Marshawn Lynch did on a bench eating a banana during the damn national anthem being played. Nobody said a word. Colin Kaepernick takes the knee. Hell has frozen over. Someday, somehow, some way, someday, somebody's going to need to explain that one to me. He exercised his rights as an American citizen, as an American citizen. Rights bled and fought and lost for him to have the right to do that. But as a result, as it was told to me, by somebody close to Jerry Jones, the owner for the Dallas Cowboys, when he addressed his team about this issue, his exact words to them was, this is a business meeting. And what he did was highlight how it was compromising his bottom line, the bottom line of the National Football League, and how ultimately it would trickle down to them if they didn't fall in line. He said this ain't about all that stuff that President Trump was talking about. This ain't about all the stuff that Colin Kaepernick was talking about. This is about the NFL. He's not protesting against the NFL. He's using the NFL platform to protest against things ailing our society which is fine if it would not cost us with our bottom line. But since it is costing us with our bottom line, we've got to prioritize. we got to make a decision. That's what Jerry Jones said. And from my understanding, it's what quite a few owners said. They weren't speaking against the rights of athletes. They weren't speaking against black folks. They weren't speaking against Law enforcement officials, they weren't speaking against anything other than what affected their bottom line. Because in the business of football, you're about the business of football. Colin Kaepernick actually would have had a stronger argument if he were protesting the NFL. Because then it would make sense. And whatever position you took against the NFL, at least somebody could sit up there and say it's the NFL. But when you're not even protesting against the NFL, but it is affecting their bottom line, Jerry Jones and other owners like McNair and Snyder and others stood up and said, why should we allow this to affect our bottom line? And your problem is not even with us. You 
still want to wear an NFL uniform. You still want to play in the National Football League. You still want to collect this check. Then why are you protect? Why are you compromising our checks? That is not difficult to comprehend. And so now we come full circle to the NFL implementing a policy that should have been implemented years ago. Should have been implemented it. Should have been in place. Well, what was the NFL busy doing instead? Collecting millions of dollars from the Department of Defense. Paid patriotism is what they called it. Where the Defense Department of the United States of America was pouring millions into the NFL's coffers just so the NFL could promote patriotism. It would assist in recruiting. It would elevate the imagery of our military in the eyes of the American public. It served as a marketing and advertising tool for our military. Fine, no problem. But one would think that at that particular moment in time, while you were receiving checks from the Department of Defense, you would have thought to have had a policy in place that would mandate you stand for the national anthem. You didn't do that as the NFL because your eyes were not on the ball with this particular issue. And now that all of this has happened, it's cost you. Not only did it compromise your bottom line with ratings and beyond, Not only did it sully your image as a league because the MLB and the NBA and others were getting money from the Department of Defense as well, according to reports. But they had mandated in their in their bylaws to stand for the national anthem. NFL did it. And now that you did, you got to find some weak compromise. You could stay in the locker room. Had you had that policy in place from day one, this wouldn't be an issue. But now that you've done what you've done, cat's out the bag. You can act if you want to, like no one's going to notice. Yes, they will. If they want to. Let Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or 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 or, or, or Ben Roethlisberger or, or Deshaun Watson even or somebody, let them come running out that locker room after the national anthems being played and watch what happens. Cat's out the bag. Cat's out the bag. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. In no way am I saying this is the wrong thing to do. There's nothing wrong about it. I just don't think it solves the problem that the NFL and its owners have at this particular moment in time. At any given moment. At any given moment, the president or somebody in a position of influence and power can decide, I want to bring attention to this bogus. What if the president right now, Donald Trump, came out and told his constituency, this policy is bogus. Who does the NFL think they're fooling? Ladies and gentlemen, they haven't resolved anything. The issue is still the same. These guys are bad dudes. This is not, this is still unpatriotic. What if Donald Trump came out and did that? What possible, what possible defense could the NFL have in its favor? One would argue they're more at the mercy of the president now than ever before. Literally as owners, as a league, you are sitting around praying that the president doesn't come out and speak on this issue against you. Because if he does, nothing's solved. You can stay in the locker room all you want to. Got to come out. And when you come out and they see that you weren't there for that national anthem. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here's Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, speaking on this new anthem policy. Listen to what he had to say. From our standpoint, uh, this is a great opportunity to continue that partnership with our players and keep the focus 
on the progress and the programs that we think are so important in the communities. Uh, we're proud of that support, and we think that that's how change is really going to be made. Uh, clearly, our objective as a league uh, and to all 32 clubs, uh, which was unanimous, is that we want people uh, to be respectful to the national anthem. We want people to stand. That's all personnel and make sure that uh, they treat this uh, moment in a respectful fashion. That's something that we think we owe. We uh, have been very sensitive in making sure that we uh, give players choices, but we do believe uh, that that moment is an important moment and one that we are going to uh, focus on. That was the commissioner, Raj Goodell. You've heard what I had to say. You hear what he has to say. What do you have to say? 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That was Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide Coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G networks. 4G LTE networks, rather. Lots of stuff to get into, and we will continue. Right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Coming up in a few minutes, the WBA. IBF heavyweight champion of the world, Anthony Joshua out of the UK. He was at the basketball game last night. He's in negotiations to fight Deontay Wilder for the heavyweight championship of the world. I personally think it's going to be a big time fight. It'll be box office. But he was at the basketball game last night. Wanted to come on. I'm happy to have him on. Looking forward to talking to him. I think this is somebody you guys will like. All of you will like. Plus, I'm going to get into the Eastern Conference Finals. Of course, the Western Conference Finals and how CP3 and James Harden saved Houston's season last night. There is so much to get into. I can't wait to talk about that. My man Brian Winters is coming on to start out for our number two as well. So I'm looking forward to it. Plus, we've got a game in Boston tonight, game five. The Celtics host the Cleveland Cavaliers and LeBron James. Got to win this game if you're Cleveland. You don't want a game seven in Boston. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter. When Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more. Like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. 30 minutes past hour number one back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Listen, the NBA Finals is a big deal, obviously, and I'm going to get into that heavily as the show progresses today. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit right now, but I'm going to veer right just for a a few minutes or so because it is my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line. This guy's from the UK. He's not from the United States. We don't care. Right now he's 21 and 0 with 20 KOs. The WBA, the IBF heavyweight champion of the world. Anthony Joshua is on the line with yours truly right now. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm feeling good. I had a good time yesterday at the game and I'm just heading to the boxing gym now to get in a workout. How are you feeling? I'm doing great. First of all, it was great meeting you for the first time. I saw you at the game last night. You had an NBA uh, NBA Western Conference Finals game with Houston and and uh, and uh, Golden State. Before I say anything else, how did you enjoy the game, and how much are you into basketball? So in the UK or in general, I've never been a massive sports fan. Parents were always working, so it wasn't a priority. But what I do admire is watching elite athletes at the top of their game perform. And I have to say, those guys are unbelievable athletes, and they've done a great job yesterday. And entertainment-wise, was ten out of ten as well. Did you were you surprised at all that the home team lost, that the Golden State Warriors lost? Were you surprised at all, or did you see it coming? You know, hard and far for a good game. You know, they done well. It was close. It was very close, and I didn't see it coming because Warriors started off very, very well. They were ahead, so you know, mm-hmm. starts you mean to finish, but um, you know. So maybe a bit of fatigue or lack of concentration played a part. And, um, you know, Houston managed to, to come back. But all in all, it was a good game. And I think they play again on Thursday, right? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yeah, in Houston. Thursday. In Houston. And- so maybe they always bounce back from a loss. People like to bounce back from a loss. 
I got you. We're talking to Anthony Joshua, uh, holds two of the heavyweight championship belts. He's right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's get it. I mean, because I, I, I've had Deontay Wilder on my radio show before, and, I, I, and yeah. I've and i never had the pleasure of talking to you. This is an extreme honor for me because I'm a big boxing fan, and I love what I see you do uh, you. right I've now. Seen you. <laughs> let, let me I've ask you, you this. Too. Let, let me ask you this question. How badly, I mean, I know you're the heavyweight champion. You're the most popular heavyweight in the world right now. Is it a situation where it's the next man up, or do you really, really want Deontay Wilder badly? Deontay Wilder is the next man up. So that's how I'm looking at it. It works both ways. Because I've hmm. gone around my career from my 16th fight, fight number 16, I became heavyweight champion of the world. And I'm 21 fights in now. And I've gone and had a heavyweight championship fight. I unified the division. And I had another unification fight with Joseph Parker. Secure. I have four heavyweight championship belts now. And Wilder's got my last one. So now, putting that fight together will be the cherry on top. And that's what we've been working towards. And I feel like it has to happen because this is what I've been working for. And he's got an opportunity to show that he's the best. So the best of the best come together. And um, it will be very entertaining. If we can take anything from that basketball game, entertainment-wise, into the boxing arena, it's going to be a good night. Now, you do know that Deontay Wilder came right on this very show and said, quote, Anthony Joshua wants no part of me. He's been ducking me. He doesn't want to fight me. This is before, obviously, you guys started talking about fighting. You do know he said that about you, right? So my, my view is, for a living, I fight. For a living Wilder fight. So in all of my life I've been fighting, I've never been scared to face any challenge. So what makes Wilder in his right mind think that he's another challenge that I'm going to be scared of facing? That's why I think talk is cheap, money buys houses. Well, you do know, Anthony Joshua, that he is 40-0 and with 39 KOs. And not only that, he saw you fight Klitschko. You knocked out Klitschko. You, you, you beat Vladimir Klitschko with the TKO. That was a tremendous fight. You got up off the mat, and you beat him down. You dropped him first. He got you with a right hand. Then you came a couple of rounds later, and you finished him off. I think Wilder saw that fight and saw Klitschko catch you with that right hand, and he believes he wouldn't have got up with a right hand coming from me. What do you say? So he believes you go when you deal with Vladimir Klitschko, you're dealing with an Olympic champion, someone from you know the Soviet Union of a of a regime in his life. Ten year heavyweight champion had more title defenses than any heavyweight champion in the world, and I went in there in my 19th fight, and I defeated him. When Wilder was fighting his 19th fight, he was fighting a six rounder in Canada. You can't compare the two. <laughs> if you want to talk about my, you know what I'm saying? So you can't talk about where I was at in my 19th fight because I'm leaps ahead of these guys. So when you talk about levels and stats and facts, you just got to look at the numbers and do the math. We're talking to Anthony Joshua, heavyweight champion of the world, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I want this fight desperately. You say you want this fight desperately. Wilder says he wants this fight desperately. Why has the fight not been signed uh, on a dotted line to happen as of yet? Why hasn't it happened? That's a question that I couldn't answer myself because I've had now six heavyweight championship fights, two unifications. I'm, I'm only talking facts. So that's, I'm not going to say this is why that is. Worse. I'm going to talk facts. I've worked okay. with champions undefeated who have had belts, and we've managed both phenomenal shows. So why would it be any different fighting Deontay Wilder? Why should it be any different? So let's put our egos aside and let's just make the fight happen for the love of the sport. Because this stuff, I said, this is what I do for a living. I do it for the love of the sport. No one really wants to get punched in the head. But if you're crazy like me and you love this, this is what we do. So let's put our egos aside and put on a phenomenal show. I've still got 10 years left in the game, so there's a lot more that people will see in me for sure. So I'm having fun with it while I'm in it. Anthony Joshua, what does Deontay Wilder need to do in order to make this fight happen? Look at, you know, coming over, to, looking at, a, I'll say, a two-fight deal. You know, let's cater for the UK fans and let's cater for the American fans as well. And um, mm. look at look at really what his worth is because this is where I work with my promoter, my manager, and um, you have to look at the value from a loss pers- uh, perspective. And just be realistic about what you want out of the fight. Because you can't live in 
fantasy world and then try and bring that into reality. Because in reality, you have to know where you're at. And in fantasy, provided he fights me, then we're going to the... Um, we're going to go to the end of the rainbow, provided we get this fight done. But right now, he has to live in reality and realize his worth. And then, provided he fights, he puts on a good performance, his stock will go up and then he can demand exactly what he wants. But we have to get in the ring before you pop your numbers. Anthony Joshua, did I hear you correctly? You want a two-fight deal. In other words, you don't want to just fight him once. You want to fight in the UK because you had 90,000 people show up for your fight at Wembley against Klitschko. You want another fight in the UK, and you want a fight in the United States of America. You want a two-fight deal with Deontay Wilder. Is that correct? 100%. And uh, I'm not in the business of having a one fight, and, you know, it's not like I'm trying to just cater for one side of the world. I understand that there's a massive audience out here and he's been catering for the audience in America. And being a world champion means you fight everywhere in the world. And I know America is the mecca of boxing, you know, so I want to definitely compete here. And what better way to announce a, a fight that bec to become the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. So let's start off in the UK. As you said, I've been catering for all of these 90,000 fans. I've managed to capture four heavyweight title belts. So in my eyes, when you do the math, I feel like I should have a bit of a say in where the fight takes place to start with. But nevertheless, we'll always return that favor and come to the USA. You know what? I got to admit, I, that, 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 that doesn't sound like a bad idea at all, Anthony Joshua. I actually never thought about that. I'm thinking about one fight, but wait a minute. You're saying, hey, I had 90,000 people show up at Wembley. Guess what? We could do that again, and then I'll guarantee you I'll come to the U.S. and fight you again. I, I, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. It really, really does. And Wilder has said what to that? You could always go back and take quotes off this fight. I think with the main design, he said, hasn't he wanted to travel to, hasn't, didn't he travel to Russia to fight for Vatican? That's his quote what Wilder said. So yeah. He said he'll travel anywhere in the world. He'll come he to did. England. So. He came on but, this show. I, he did say yeah, that. But he did say that. So I'm not going to start saying, you know, I'm not going to take a two minute clip from our interview and say, well, this is what you said. And um, you have to stick by it. But if he's that willing to travel, we've shown what we're capable of doing. Let's let's get him involved in the party and let's have some fun. This is fun to me. Let's rock and roll. Honestly, I live for this. I breathe for this. That's why I managed to put myself in a position and I'm ready to kind of continue down this journey. There's no fear in my heart, man. This is what I decided to do from 18 years old. Mm. Anthony Joshua right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Before I let you go, Deontay Wilder said he would knock you out. Is no way in hell it will go to distance. Anthony Joshua, what do you believe you would do to Deontay Wilder? You know, everyone says this, everyone says that. But you know, you're going to have to tune in to see I'm a boxing masterclass. I'll pick him apart. He won't be able to cope up. Then when he's back for, he's going to tire. He's going to start making mistakes. And I'm not, like, the credit to Luis Ortiz, he showed a lot of flaws in, in Wilder's um, technique and how you can expose him, but I'm a different animal. And um, unfortunately for him and his family, I want to leave him flat on his back unconscious. So you, you're basically saying, you're, so you're guaranteeing a knockout too, is that correct? That's what we do. That's what we do. My man, I want to let you know it was great, great talking to you. I'm going to be talking about pleasure. this potential fight. It was an honor to meet you. I really wish you nothing but the best. I can't wait to see Thank this you. fight. I want y'all to sign it on the dotted line and get it done. Do you have a preference in the United States where you would like this fight to take place? Because Vegas is an option. New York is an option. But that 100,000-seat stadium that is Jerry World in Dallas, Texas, is an option, too. Do you have a preference? And that's what I was going to ask you. Number one, where is the biggest stadium? And number two, let's go. If everyone's going right, Vegas, New York, let's go left. Let's go to the biggest stadium and do something completely different. Why do we that would be Dallas. do the same thing? Let's go to that Dallas. Would Dallas. You know? That would be Dallas. That would be Dallas. Vegas should get 19,000 right, seats. Left. Madison Square Garden, 19,000. But it ain't Wembley like 90,000. That would have to be Jerry World in Dallas. Yeah, man. I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. My man, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. And it was no, great seeing you at the, the, the playoffs well. last night. Thank you to all the listeners as well that are tuning in. And stay true for more news to come very soon. Thanks a lot, buddy. You take it easy. Right. I'll talk to you down the road. Take care, thank bro. you. Thanks for having me. All right, buddy.
the one and only Anthony Joshua. Four belts in the heavyweight division, a heavyweight champion of the world. He's got one belt that he's after, and that's the belt Deontay Wilder is holding. Who do you think will win that fight? Very, very interesting. I can tell you that much. Both of them can hit. Both of them got power. They're heavyweights. And Anthony Joshua is incredibly powerful. Thousands upon thousands of fans will follow him from Europe to see him. If they fought, if they, if they came to see Ricky Hatton against Pacquiao or Mayweather, you best believe they'd come to the States to see him against Deontay Wilder, the undefeated heavyweight champion with one belt, 39 KOs in his 40 fights. But Deontay is from Alabama. If the fight was in Dallas, they fly, they drive down there to see him too. So I think Jerry World would be packed 80, 90,000 strong for that fight. I know I'd be there and I think you should too. Your calls and more in a minute before my man, Brian Wintos comes on to talk about these conference finals in the NBA. You're listening live to Stephen A on ESPN radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. 888-SAY-ESPN is the number to call up. It's 888-729-3776. In hour number two, we will continue getting into the NBA playoffs, the Western Conference Finals. What a tremendous, tremendous victory by the Houston Rockets yesterday. Who's your star of the game? Who's your hero of the game? I can't wait to share with you who mine is. And I'll tell you that about that in hour number two. Plus, LeBron James takes his calves in the Boston for game five. I think they got to win that game because I don't think they won a game seven back in Boston. I just don't see this Cleveland Cavaliers team with this support base. I don't see that happening. Plus, I got to get into the national anthem issue as well because we talked about that in the first go round, first hour. We'll be talking about that as well with the NFL new rules regarding the national anthem. Either stand up for the national anthem or stay in the locker room until it's over. All that and more coming up in hour number two, but not before my man Brian Windhorse comes on to break down the conference finals. Hour number two up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. Zip Recruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on Zip Recruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive. So you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all size trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. ZipRecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. That's ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Come to hour number two of the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Coming at you as I love to do every weekday. Over the airways of ESPN Radio, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 80. You know when something's so obvious they call it a no-brainer? Well, here's a big one. Barbasol is finally making raises. Introducing the Barbasol Ultra 6 Plus. It's got six ultra-thin blades for a close, comfortable shave. You can go to Barbasol.com right now and save some money. That's a no-brainer, too. By the way, the NBA Eastern Conference Finals are on ESPN Radio. Tune in tonight for Game 5 as Jason Tatum and the Celtics host LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Presented by Indeed. Coverage begins at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on most ESPN radio stations. Beautiful segue into my next guest covering the NBA in exceptional fashion. He's a reporter and insider and everything in between. Does a great job for us. My buddy, the one and only Brian Windhorse, is on the line with us right now. What's going on, man? How are you? Stephen A., how are you, sir? I'm doing all right. Always good to talk to you. First things first, before I get to the conference finals you are covering, because I know you're in the East, 
Your thoughts about what you witnessed last night from Houston in their victory against the Golden State Warriors? I, I think it should be studied by playoff teams in the future because when a team like the Warriors is as red hot as they were in that third quarter and Curry is throwing in those shots and Durant is and sometimes pretty well covered and just rising up and draining them in your face and that crowd in that tiny little arena, that crowd is just pulsing. I mean, what's the knockout percentage in that in that moment, Stephen? A ninety nine point nine percent, probably about ninety nine point nine. And it was so impressive to me that the Rockets would stand up and continue to fight and continue to grind. These NBA games are so long; you are going to have the opportunity to recover. Really, recovery is a huge part of an NBA playoff series, and so regardless of the individual moments that happened, and certainly Chris Paul played up. A wonderful game. One of the best games of his career, probably. Their ability, and I thought, you know, the, the TNT crew had um, some some sound inside uh, D'Antoni, from D'Antoni in the huddle. Their ability to withstand that punch, stay on their keep and keep and stay on their feet and keep fighting was so impressive to me and really should be a, 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 a reminder for everybody in these playoffs. If the Cavs get down tonight to the Celtics at home or vice versa, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to if I were Ty Lue or Brad Stevens reminding those guys in the huddle about the Rockets last night. I got to admit to you, Brian Wintos, I mean, I looked at the Houston Rockets last night. I'm stunned. After that onslaught by Steph Curry and those boys in the third quarter, when Steph hit five threes and scored 17 points and was shimmying all the time and everything else, I, I thought Houston was done. I really, really did. And for them to come back, it's one thing for them to have the moxie, the bravado per se, thinking they could knock off the reigning defending NBA champions. But then to pull it off in the fashion that they did with that game last night, I think this could be the defining moment of a championship run. They, they There's no question in my mind. They have no doubt now that they could take out Golden State. What do you make of that? I think I think something did get revealed. All, as great as this Warriors team is, and I've um, had the belief that this is when they're at their full power that they're the best team of all time. The truth is that they're a little bit shallow. Um, the, all the money that they've spent on that front end has robbed them, and they you know they made some roster decisions um, that have affected them, and they've had some tough decisions, and they've had some guys get hurt. But losing Andre Iguodala, they don't have a lot of forgiveness on that second unit. Now, the, where they have forgiveness is in firepower. Um, you know, Steph Curry goes down for a couple of weeks or a month with uh, a knee issue. They have another MVP in reserve. So I don't want to make it sound like they don't have depth. But um, when, when you have to play Draymond Green 45 minutes, which, is, which, was, a, which was a result of Andre Iguodala not being able to play, all of a sudden you see that there, are, there is a little flaw or two in that roster. And I expect them to roar back. But um, that is where they, they do have some vulnerability. And, and Iguodala is an extremely important player for them. That's why they spent so much money to re-sign him last year, even though he's a guy who's you know, past his prime. Why do you expect Golden State to roar back after what you saw last night, Brian? Because I just have so much respect for them as a, as a team. Um, I do think that they are facing their most challenging game, boy, since probably since Game 7 of the 2016 Finals, no. um, you know, in Game which 5 in Houston. Which they did lose. Which they did lose. Um, but I, I have a lot of belief in that team. Like I said, I do think when they're at full power. But look, <clears throat> we don't know about Iguodala's knee. We don't know how Clay Thompson is going to come out. If they're not their full team, they're not their full team. If they are their full team, I have confidence that they'll win, but we got to see that injury report. That's a major fact. This is what I always say to people in Cleveland who, you know, realize that even if they get through this series with the, with the Cavs uh, or with the Celtics, you know, how could you possibly ever touch the team like the Warriors or Rockets? And I always say, as I said in 2016, you always got to run out the ground ball. Because you always got to play hard because you never know what could happen in the NBA because teams are fragile. Yeah, the ground ball may be being hit to Ozzie Smith in his prime, but you still got to run it out. That's what the Cavs did in 2016, and that's what the Rockets did last night. Stay with me for a second, Brian Wintoss, covering the NBA for ESPN. He's right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I, and I'm just going to, before I get to the Eastern Conference, I, I, I just want to dissect three individuals. When I look at CP3, I constantly harken back, and I know you're big on this. The starting point of when the winning took place, Brian, matters to me. 
I think about when CP3 was with the Clippers and they had an opportunity to go to the conference finals and they blew it with that collapse against Houston. Their next opponent in the conference finals would have been the Golden State Warriors, who had yet not learned how to win. And I think that the fact that CP3 missed out on that specific opportunity, what is what made last night's game to me so important for him, knowing that he was in his first conference finals, knowing that this was the team that he was going up against, knowing that they had just lost by 41 and everybody was believing Golden State was going to run them out of here. This game was everything to him because of all of those increments, which is what made his performance so much more heroic. What do you say to that? You know, I my respect for CP3 has been immense. Uh, ever since Game 7 of that series against the Spurs a couple years ago. That was as high a level basketball as you'll ever see in the first round of a playoff series. And he carried the Clippers home in that game, made a couple of enormous plays down the stretch. I yes, never was a believer. I was never a believer that he had some sort of issue. And But I also think that the lesson from that 3-1 series that they blew is that it's never over, that there always is time. And again, I can't. Chris Paul has taken a a young player, a player even in his second or third playoffs, may not have been able to to, to carry himself through the onslaught of emotion that that third game, that third quarter presented to the to the Rockets. You could argue that Chris Paul has been building his whole career to that moment to be able to steady his team and make plays down the stretch. That one three that he hit. Um, sort of fading back, um, I can't remember who was guarding him, but over the top, was a crucial, crucial basket. Uh, you know, and, and his ability to I think that was that over shot. Steph Curry. I think that was over Steph Curry, but I'm not sure. Uh, just, um, you know, he could not have been that player. I think he would even admit this if he was speaking freely to you. He wasn't that player two or three years ago. He's that player today. Just like LeBron. There were times when his best friend LeBron wasn't the player that could carry up and hit a shot at the buzzer of a game uh, on you know uh, where everything was rising to him. He, 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 they are products of their experience. Last night, what game wasn't just one in that moment; it was one in years of experience um, uh, from Chris Paul and James Harden too. James Harden, uh, you know, was, was a little that. bit shell shocked yeah. early on, and he rallied too. Yeah, James Harden. Did he? How much amends did he make for last year's performance against the San Antonio Spurs in that game six? Yeah, and also just some of the moments he's had in this series where he hasn't been able to deliver. Um, right. I, 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 when he went when he went in there and dunked on Draymond Green when they were when they were down, I mean that was another message to his team. That was message to a team that he was continuing to fight. Um, uh, yeah, Stephen A., I don't know how the series is going to go. Uh, my instincts are so favored towards the Warriors, but Mine's this too. is you know we've seen this in the past where there is a huge pivotal moment in the series and teams. Uh, turn the tide, and I'm going to be waiting and watching to see if that's the case. The irony in all of this, Brian, is I can't believe we got to sit here and give Mike D'Antoni credit for defense because their defense <laughs> showed up last week too. Points. Who, whoever would have thought that quarter. a Mike D'Antoni team would hold somebody to 12 points in a fourth quarter, let alone an offensive firepower like this, the Golden State Warriors. We're talking to Brian Windows right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's get to the series that you're covering right now because I got to tell you something. I don't like the thought of Cleveland in a game seven in Boston with this unit, but I do like Cleveland and their, and their potential for a game five. I think that even though Boston played competitively, they were scrappy in game four. They didn't just fold in the end. This series is tied two two. LeBron smells blood. And I think that this is, this is going to be a tough, tough fight for the Boston Celtics tonight compared to what they had to deal with in games one and two. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is a major game. This this is right up there. Um, this will be the biggest game that, you know, guys like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, Terry Rozier have ever played in. I know that they played a seven-game series in the first round. I'm aware of that. But it's a little bit different with LeBron. And the thing that the Cavs have right now, they have a little bit of traction defensively, which are words I never thought I'd ever say. The last three games – the Celtics are only shooting 41% as a team. And what's happened in that stretch, Tristan Thompson in the starting lineup, LeBron James switched over to Jalen Brown early in the games, Larry Nance coming off the bench. I think Larry Nance is their best uh, individual defender. Um, and they've been able to play with a lot more defensive energy. They had eight blocks um, in game four, which is not something that they're known for. Um, and so their ability to, to turn up the defense has given them a chance in this series. The second half of game two, 
which is where the Celtics overwhelmed the Cavs and won that game, is the only difference between this being 3-1 Cavs right now. Because after that change to Thompson, they have been different defensively. Now, this Cavs team has not been a consistent team throughout the entire season. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, they've discovered it. Um, But if they carry that defense over from in Cleveland, and the thing about it is, Stephen A., they won game four only making eight three-pointers. Typically, when they don't make at least 13 threes, that's a losing. That's a losing effort. But they won that game. They survived. The Celtics are the best comeback team in the league, or one of them. Certainly the best comeback team in the East. They made a couple of runs at the Cavs. They withstood it. And I, it's all because of their defense. So to me, it's a, it's a situation of whether the Cavs' defense can hold up tonight because you know LeBron's going to show up. It's interesting that you bring all of that stuff up because I'm thinking about uh, what you said about Tristan Thompson being inserted into the starting lineup. Uh, ultimately, Larry Nance getting some PT as well, and we all know that he can play some defense. Uh, what are we to make of Ty Lue's performance in this series? I only ask because we never hesitate to rave about Brad Stevens and the job that he has done and the great young coach he's proven to be. He's only 41 years of age. But Ty Lue has proven something as well in this series, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he's he's made some tactical moves that have really worked. Also, they just did some they did some various things with their offense that freed up some of their shooters. And Brad Stevens is is doing work too. And the series ain't over. Brad Stevens has got some some dice to throw tonight, some some moves to make tonight. But, you know, last year, in all honesty, I mean, I know that they had LeBron and Kyrie Irving, but if you really broke down that series, um, the Cavs were, from a, from a strategic and tactical uh, edge, you know, they completely outperformed the Celtics last year. Um, Ty Lue has done a very good job against Brad Stevens before. He doesn't have the same firepower this year, but he's performed pretty well in this uh, in this series. Even though he's had he's put some lineups out there that at times of he struggled with, he's still trying to find his team. Uh, I think Ty Lue, uh, you know, for some reason, even though he's had nothing but success, he's had one of the greatest playoff coaching winning percentages of all time. He does seem to draw a lot more fire than he does praise. In fact, he almost never gets praise. Um, and you know, he's not perfect either. But uh, you know, he says he has changed the starting lineup four different times in this postseason, and he's re- re- routinely been able to rally his team when they've needed it. And I think that should be you know recognized. I agree with you. Rob Widow's right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. You've been covering LeBron James since he was in junior high school. Uh, He knows you well. You've known him very, very well. He's been in the league for 15 years. He's age 33. Um, He looks better, some would say, than he's ever looked. Do you feel that way, A? And how do you explain how great he has looked, considering the fact that he's logged over 44,200-plus minutes in a regular season in his NBA career and is approaching nearly 10,000 minutes um, in the playoffs. How do you explain he's also, that? He's also played some, some intense Olympic games, too. He had, he right. had those in there. Um, you know, in, in game four, the, the Cavs' outside shot wasn't falling. And and they and they needed baskets at times. The, the Celtics were putting pressure on, and LeBron did what a lot of people sometimes criticize him for not doing. He put his head down and went to the rim. He scored thirteen uh, thirteen baskets in the paint in Game Four. Um, he did what his team needed him to do, and that's sort of the thing. I mean, he's been so incredible in this postseason that when he has a forty four point game in a in a must win game, the Cavs lose that game, they're done. Um, in a must win game. Uh, he scores 44 points and people don't make a big deal of it. He didn't make a big deal of it. He he all but shrugged about his performance afterwards. It was a classic LeBron game, and he's, he keeps having those. And the fact that he has been able to make this type of greatness routine is an ode to him, just like it's an ode to him that people compare him to Jordan. When you've risen so far in your profession that you literally have no peer who's playing with you. There's no peer that you can be compared to, and you are compared to ghosts, men that you don't ever even have to face. That is an incredible compliment that nobody's comparing him to anybody else in the league. And the fact that he can have a 44-point game in a vital playoff game where he goes to the basket and plays fearless basketball under immense pressure, and nobody can flip out and realize that that's a better game than 99.9% of any NBA player will ever have in his career is another compliment to his greatness, even though it's easy to get used to it. But Brian Wintos, are people in Cleveland truly appreciating it and loving every moment of it? 
or are they looking at it with some level of resignation because they get the sense that this is it? This could be the last they're seeing of him in a class, in a Cavaliers uniform. You know, there's um, there's a lot. This has been a great postseason for Cavs fans. They've gotten to see some in, 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 in some amazing LeBron stuff in their building. He's hit two buzzer beating game winners in front of them in their building this year. Uh, huge game four the other night. Um, obviously, it, it hangs over like a cloud. But there's a, there, you know what else hangs over that whole crowd is um, is that banner. And that banner, that 2016 championship, gives LeBron a lot of of, of leeway to to, to work out processes by himself. And I still look out there, Stephen A., and I still don't see the the landing spot for LeBron that is worth severing his tie with Cleveland over. Now, we get to July 1st and we get through the draft and we see trades and and all kinds of other stuff, maybe it'll look different. But for him to sever that, that tie, it's got to be an incredibly compelling situation. I still I do. don't see it. I do see it, Brian. You want me to share it with you? Please. I don't. A lot of people talk about Philly. I'm not sold on that. I can't I believe agree. that LeBron would leave Cleveland to go right up the road to Philadelphia uh, to chase another ring. I just don't see that. Okay. Houston, you want to be out west. It's plausible to me, even though highly unlikely, because they got to take care of CP3. At least that's what they've said. And pairing him with Harden and CP3, if they were to lose this series and fail to beat Golden State, him taking them over the hump against the Golden State Warriors, that's plausible to me. But I think L.A. in this sense, I think the family, the warm weather, the sunshine, a different life experience to some degree. I know they somewhat had that in Miami, but that was LeBron's individual personal goal. He had to be in a better environment to facilitate capturing a championship and learning what champions champions are made of. Whereas in the case of LA, I think it's a lifestyle family kind of thing that might influence his decision to go out there. You say that. You say what to that? I, if, if he said that, if he said, I have a, I have one act left in my career, I have a final act, and my, you know, my family and I want to enjoy it in Los Angeles, and we're going to fight the good fight, in my mind, go for it, sign with the Lakers, and do your best. But from a basketball standpoint, the situation is not ideal. And he would go in knowing that he would probably have, at best, the third or fourth best team. And again, now, now, now if they trade for Kawhi Leonard on, yeah, on June 25th, possible. which okay, is possible then, and acquire then, Paul then we, George, then we have a different conversation. But today, today right. getting LeBron does not make them a championship team. And that would be a major shift for LeBron to not be on a team that would be considered a, you know, a great chance to win a championship that year. And if he says that, I understand that, and I'm prepared to deal with that, and I'm prepared to grow and build with the Lakers. Um, then I will say, okay, that that's what your priority is. I get it. Go for it. I wish you the best of luck. But that's not who the LeBron that I know. The LeBron that I know can't stand the thought of possibly being home in June. And if he's at home in June this year, it's not going to be because he didn't have a great opportunity. The Cavs just wouldn't have got it done. So um, that's why yeah. I say I don't for, – for, for him to tell Cleveland goodbye – and for him to, to say, I'm going to go to a third team, I would just think you would have to check all the boxes or at least check off four of the well, five major boxes. And, and, and what I just I'm don't saying, know if the Lakers are there. And what I'm saying, because I'm not debating it with you, I'm, because you would know better than me. I'm just giving you a perspective based right. on all the players involved. And you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Everybody that talks to him, about him, et cetera, et cetera. I get the impression that the one thing that he can pull off without severing that tie with Cleveland, without alienating folks and angering them. If he sat up there and said, I've done my part, I've done all I could do, it's about life now, not just about basketball. If you made that call, I don't think anybody in Cleveland could nor would have a problem with that. I think they'd have a problem with any other scenario they could come up with. As far as I'm concerned, his legacy has been set, especially his legacy in Cleveland. I believe the same he can thing. Do, he, he can do whatever he wants. 
It's just a matter of prioritizing. And that's the difference between 2014 and 2010 and 2018. He's not, he's going to have to prioritize. He's not going to be able to have it all. Last question for you. Who's winning tonight's game in Boston? You know, Stephen, I, it, I can't read this Cavs team. I respect Neither what they've I. done defensive. I respect what they've done defensively. If they bring their defense, I think they've got a good chance to take it. But they are they are a flat out bad defensive team that's an overachieving. So I'm nervous about throwing the die down and saying they're going to win. But it's hard to bet against the LeBron team. And I'll I'll say this: if I'm going to be wrong on LeBron, it's going to be because I'm late. <laughs> I'm not going to be the first guy through that says LeBron's going to get beat. It's obviously going to happen at some point, but it's not going to be because I'm put getting out in front of it. So if I had to 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 to, to side with somebody, I'm going to side with LeBron. I'm picking LeBron and Cleveland tonight because I think LeBron James knows in his heart of hearts they need to avoid a Game 7 in that building in Boston. Game 5 would be the most ideal circumstance under which to take these guys out. That way you can go back to the queue for Game 6. You don't have to go to, you don't have to go back to Boston for Game 7, but that's just me. I agree with you. Take it easy, buddy. Great work as always. Looking forward to watching you tonight, buddy. All right. Take care. Brian Wintos, ESPN. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. He hasn't called back yet. I might be getting off the hook right now. That might be a good thing. It really, really might. Bill and Queens, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Good good afternoon, Stephen. Thanks for taking my call. I'm all right. Go Uh, ahead, Bill. I have to respectfully disagree with something. two things you said. One, you said that it's everybody's right to protest. It's your right to protest on your time. If I'm at work or you're at work, you can't do whatever you want to do. We have people that we answer to that make rules, just like the owners of the NFL. And I believe you have said this, that the owners have a right to be upset if this protest is affecting their bottom line. Well, listen, listen, so you have they, the right, you have the right, you do have the right to protest. You also have the right to face consequences. What I'm saying about having a right is that you're not going to be incarcerated for it. In this country, you do have the freedom to protest. And right, usually so protests are somewhat, usually protests are disorderly. Um, in the end, what I would say to you about this bill is that I still come to that, to that belief with football because there was no law mandating that they could not. No bylaws. Like the NBA mandates you stand. They didn't do that in the NFL. You see what I'm saying? I work for the city of New York. If they want me to wear a pink bunny suit to work, I can't say I'm not going to wear it. Well, you either wear it or you're unemployed. Time out. There's no Time out, Bill. Bill, Bill, you're not listening. The NFL did not have anything in its bylaws prohibiting that. Kneeling for the national anthem. The NBA did. The NFL dropped the ball because they didn't have those rules in place. So there was never any violation. If I come That's in tomorrow morning, I'm Jerry Jones, and I come into the locker room tomorrow morning, I sign your paycheck, and I say, from now on, nobody's kneeling, or there's going to be consequences. You know why you're wrong, I'm, Bill? You want me to tell you why you're wrong? Because you, didn't wrong. Have a collective, because you didn't have a collective bargaining agreement backing you up. But the I'm still the did. owner, though. Yeah, but the play, but but why do you think that the owners had a problem? Because they couldn't force these guys to do anything because they were collect they had a collective bargaining agreement. Otherwise, they would have done they would have been done exactly what you just said they would have done. You they couldn't do it because then you then you have an argument. I could suspend you from work and then you go to a hearing and then then then, then but then you would have right, lost. Then you, you would win now because you would win now because of the new rules that are being implemented. What I'm saying to you is that those rules were not in place. So because they were not in place, you didn't have a leg to stand on to mandate that the players do anything of the kind. 
You didn't have a right to do that because you didn't have the rules in place. That was where they dropped the ball, which was why they had this stuff going on with the league meetings. If it were not for that, they would have already done it. I can tell you right now from experience with state arbitrators in New York, it's not always that simple. And the, the, the bosses, I don't want to say they can make up rules as they go along, but they can implement things that don't necessarily aren't spelled out in a contract. And you go to arbitration and you lose. That, that's that's okay. the real world. That is the real world, but that ain't the sports world. But I appreciate your point. Thank you. Take it easy. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Is that my man I see calling in right now? Is that him? Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. on the line right now is the actor, comedian, singer, extraordinaire, the one and only Jamie Foxx is on the line right now. Yes. Why are you calling my show in the middle and of the afternoon, said, Jamie Foxx? First of all, let's, let's be very clear. Let's be very clear. <laughs> very clear. Cleveland, <laughs> Cleveland A. Smith is very upset right now with my with my brother, Stephen A. Smith. Stephen <laughs> A. Smith, this is all I got to ask. This is all I got to ask. I think, first of all, let's just be honest. This is the excitement in basketball and NBA that we didn't think we were going to get. That's we true. thought that the Golden State Warriors were going to roll right through. I mean, we were all guilty of saying it was a wash. We didn't anticipate the yep. heart of a Chris Paul, which I really think he turned the corner last night. He turned the corner because, you know, everybody gets to that point in their life where you go like, I always fail at this point. And he turned a huge corner in front of everybody. That shocked the world. What I, what, here's what I don't understand. Maybe you could give me some clarity on this. Mm-hmm. Had that been LeBron James last night on the losing end of that, mm-hmm. there would be pitchforks. There would be people tearing down this man's uh, uh, legacy. I'm yeah. just asking why, why, and, and I have to, I'm, I'm not accusing you, Stephen A. Smith, <laughs> but you are one to go at someone. I've seen you. Oh, and he was absolutely god awful. I don't care what anybody says. He's the worst. He shouldn't have been born. Talk to his parents. Why did his parents have him? Why did his parents even have him? That's what I. I want to know. This. This is what I want to know. I, I want to know because I think I had an answer. But why is there a different measuring tool when it comes to LeBron James and anybody else? I'm going to say this to you, Jamie Foxx. I don't appreciate yes. you calling me my, I don't appreciate you calling my show, putting me on the spot like this. Well, I just said all that, and, here's the, and here's the biggest reason why. Because you're wow. right. You're right. Wow. If this wow. were LeBron, if this were LeBron James instead of oh Kevin, my. if LeBron James had shot nine for 24 last night, if LeBron James had given up that last shot to Clay Thompson in a damn corner, oh we would be all oh over him. You're absolutely right, Jamie Foxx. And what, but why, if why, I'm trying, this is what I'm trying to figure out. I think we're missing something in this generation. We're missing out on the, probably the, one of the greatest to cloud and there's so many different things attached to him, nuances and things like that that has nothing to do with the game of basketball. We can't figure out. I'm a huge LeBron fan. At the same time, I, I put myself in. Back in the day when Kobe was killing everything, I was rooting against Kobe because I was a Maverick fan. So everything he did, I figured out a way to say that it was wrong. He scored 81. Oh, yeah, but I mean, that was the leap year, though. It was May 29th. I would always figure out something to try to take a chink out of Kobe. Jamie, are you there? Jamie, we lost you. Miss, oh. if that's what we're doing. Well, listen, I will say this to you. You might be right about that. I would say to you that, to me, I'm going to get on LeBron the way I get on anybody else, but you are absolutely right. Kevin Durant, it's not so much what we say about LeBron, it's what we don't say about others. You are bringing up a very valid point. After what happened last night, it was just last night, but after what happens last night, we should be all over Kevin Durant. He's one of the top three players in the world, and we should have been all over him. But you know why you don't? Why? For some reason, LeBron James represents something that we've never really seen before. He's a, he's a, he's a killer without the 
killer instinct that we all claim he doesn't have. He's a nice guy. He he does all of these different things that we just can't put our can't put our we can't put our mind around. I don't know what it is, mm. but when you say LeBron James, it's two reactions. It's either they love him to pieces or they hate him. There's no either he's at the top of the mountain or he's at the bottom of the ocean. And I and and, and I just think that it's because he's so. He's so great, and he, we take it for granted. Think about this, Stephen, and I'm going to let you go. Think about this. Think about what this guy does with All people right. he just met. He I can't just believe I got to rush. I got to rush the great Jamie Foxx because I only got go. a minute left, go. but go ahead. Got to go. Then, no, no, but just think of, Listen, I just want to know. All I wanted to know is, first of all, Forget about that. How great is the NBA right now? It's exciting. It's wonderful. And you it's keep wonderful. it exciting, Stephen A. Smith. And I want to say this all day. I will see you one day. Cleveland will be talking to you soon. So make sure you, you we set up some time to go to dinner. What do we have to do? I love what you do, Stephen A. Hold Smith. Hold it, hold it. Not only are we going to dinner, I need you, bro. I got to host NBA Finals specials live from the NBA Final One hour specials. I have you. I have to I'm have here. you on as one of my guests. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there, bro. Please. Come on. Don't Consider have to it ask done. I'm there. And, 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 yo, and, and dinner is on me, not Cleveland A. Oh. Not Cleveland A. It's on me. Cleveland A. Cleveland A. All right, baby. <laughs> Love you, bro. Thanks a lot, man. Love I'll you, see dude. you soon. No doubt. The one and only Jamie Foxx right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. By the way, it's time to ditch your outdated sports drink and switch to Body Armor sports drink with natural flavors and sweetness and no colors from artificial sources. Body Armor is the more natural, better sports drink. Going to close out the show in just a few minutes. Jamie Foxx calling in and prompt to unexpected to the Stephen A. Smith show on ESPN radio. And by the way, this is not Cleveland A. It's Stephen A. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Got to get on out of here soon enough. But let's go to Carlton and Tampa. Real quick, Carlton, go ahead, buddy. The floor is yours. Today's show shows that no matter how successful you are, whether you're a Stephen A. Smith or a Jamie Foxx, you can be a delusional social justice warrior lunatic. As far as what Fox said about LeBron, he got none of the blame for the first two losses against the Celtics. He played zero defense. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen tonight, Stephen A. If he doesn't set the tone on the defensive side from jump one and do it for 40 minutes in the face of that unrelenting Boston crowd, they are going to lose game five. And, and, and the Celtics will be back in the driving seat in this thing. And then, and then as it pertains to Bill Belichick today, the one thing that you got wrong on your show today is Bill Belichick holds grudges, Stephen A. And Tom Brady not showing up for OTAs has rankled him to no end. And just like he did with Malcolm Butler and Jamie Collins, it's not Tom how he feels about the coach, but how the coach feels about Tom that is going to keep this Fisher alive and, and actually negatively impact them this season. I got it, Carlton. I appreciate your call. Thank you so much. I don't think I was delusional. I left that out about uh, Bill Belichick because I'm talking about it all the time. I might have forgot. That's number one. Number two, 
when it comes to uh, LeBron James, some of the errors. Here's the bottom line. We can say what we want about LeBron James, but the one thing that is undeniable, he's the best in the world. He really, really is right now. He's the best in the world. There's no other way around it. He's a physical freak of nature, and as Brian Winter said, we're comparing him to Ghost because there's no equal to him playing in the NBA as we speak. Maybe next year or the year after. We keep saying it's a year away or the next year after. We keep saying it, but that has yet to have taken place. These are the kind of things that we're thinking about. Game five tonight, Cleveland versus Boston. I'm picking Cleveland. I ain't sure about it. I'm not even confident about it, but I picked Cleveland in six, and I'm sticking to it. Talk to y'all tomorrow. Peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. Zip Recruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on Zip Recruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And Zip Recruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive, so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. Zip Recruiter. Is how you find them. Businesses of all size trust Zip Recruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try Zip Recruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ziprecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's ziprecruiter.com slash Stephen A. Ziprecruiter.com slash Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. That's Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. It is my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line. This guy's from the UK. He's not from the United States. We don't care. Right now, he's 21 and 0 with 20 KOs. The WBA, the IBF heavyweight champion of the world, Anthony Joshua, is on the line with yours truly right now. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm feeling good. I had a good time yesterday at the game, and I'm just heading to the boxing gym now to get in a workout. How are you feeling? I'm doing great. First of all, it was great meeting you for the first time. I saw you at the game last night. You had an NBA uh, NBA Western Conference Finals game with Houston and and uh, and uh, Golden State. Before I say anything else, how did you enjoy the game, and how much are you into basketball? So in the UK or in general, I've never been a massive sports fan. Parents were always working, so it wasn't a priority. But what I do admire is watching elite athletes at the top of their game perform. And I have to say, those guys are unbelievable athletes, and they've done a great job yesterday. And entertainment-wise, was ten out of ten as well. Did you were you surprised at all that the home team lost, that the Golden State Warriors lost? Were you surprised at all, or did you see it coming? You know, hard and far for a good game. You know, they done well. It was close. It was very close, and I didn't see it coming because Warriors started off very, very well. They were ahead, so you know, mm-hmm. starts you mean to finish, but um, you know. So maybe a bit of fatigue or a lack of concentration played a part. And, um, you know, Houston managed to, to come back. But all in all, it was a good game. And I think they play again on Thursday, right? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yeah, in Houston. Thursday. In Houston. In- so maybe they always bounce back from a loss. People like to bounce back from a loss. I got you. We're t- 